Thank you, thank you, thank you. Please be seated. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> How you doing? Yes, it is. I'm really thankful that Garrett shared with you that you have a spirit in you that includes a tutor and an instructor, because to be honest with you, I don't know how to quite convey what I'd like to convey today, so, but the pressure's not on me. It's on <laughs> Jesus to teach you so he can clarify for you what I might not be as clear about, but I'm going to try my best, okay? Um, the title of the teaching is The Spirit of Life. I want to start with, of course, the beginning. <laughs> and we're going to get through Revelation in 35 minutes. Um, I really want to, uh, so just think about this, guys. Let's just try to really meditate on what God wanted when he did what he did in Genesis. What was he looking for? Okay, and there's a lot of ways you can unpack that. There's a lot of words. I mean, dwelling with us is one way of doing it, of, one, of thinking about it, because he wanted to dwell with human beings. That's clear, and it comes up over and over in the scriptures. But I really want you to think about this on a, on a personal level, on a kind of a human level, right down to how we live and how we operate as human beings. What he wanted to do, the creator of the heavens and the earth desired that he would somehow be able to intimately become one with us through his spirit interacting with our spirit so that we could take that and be as human beings, whole people, body, soul, and spirit now connected to him, project his image into the world so that we could be a physical, a mental, an emotional, a human being, a fully human being is one who actually has this connection with God and can project that into the world. And the mission was to be fruitful, to multiply, and to replenish the earth and to subdue it for him so his glory could cover the earth like the waters cover the seas. And that's what he wanted. And that's what we were. That is what a human being, a fully human being, is that kind of person. And it was there. I mean, they had it, right? Adam and Eve had that. They lived it. Can you imagine? They lived it. And then it was lost. It was lost. And I don't know how to express what that really means. I, I don't know how you can express the tearing apart of this. And this, this notion now that human beings have been radically, radically altered, changed, the very nature of a human being is now corrupted, cast out, disfigured. You think of sin, don't think of just behaviors and morals. Think of it not just missing the mark, although that's literally what the word means. Think of it as a disfigurement, as an erosion of an image that was to bear God's goodness. Sin disfigures, dis it defaces. And the big S, the big sin, is it goes right to the soul of a human being, right to the very nature of human beings. Now, how big a fall is that? To go from this connection with, the, with God and all of his goodness to being a disfigured, corrupted nature. And what does it look like? Well, Cain mur murdered Abel. There's your first hint of how different this is. And then it got so bad that God described the human race as every thought and intent of their heart was only evil continually. So he did a big reset, and it was called Noah. So Noah planted a garden, and there's all sorts of Eden language back in that when you read those records. It's like, okay, we're doing this again. And he plants a garden, and God gives him a, a promises to be fruitful and to multiply, just like he gave to Adam and Eve. It didn't work out, though. He had a garden, yes. He grew some wine, beautiful thing, gets drunk, ends up in his tent. I don't know what happened, but one of his sons comes in there, and, and out of that comes a cursed progeny called Canaan. And from Canaan came Nimrod, who builds a tower and says, hey, let us make us a name. Human beings, you know what? We're so cool. We're so awesome. Even in our disfigured, corrupted state, we don't need God. We're going to make a tower and give us a name in heaven. Didn't work. God dispersed them in their languages all over the planet. 
all over the known world, whatever. And, we, and so we, we, we rush forward in first 11 chapters of Genesis, and it gets to this guy, Abraham. So 11 chapters, I mean, it covers like 2,000 years or something. I mean, it's, it's a long time in 11 chapters. But it's, it's, it's to like, let's get to the point. This is what God wants to do. I want to get to the point. I want to get back to where I can have fellowship, this connection with people. And instead of forming Abraham and Sarah out of the whole ground like he did with Adam and Eve, what did he do? He miraculously creates a son, Isaac, in people whose bodies are dead, unable, not capable of bringing forth a child. And he does that. And it's in Isaac that he calls an entire nation of people. Not all the people on the earth, right? These aren't all the people on the earth. These are people that come from a couple, Abraham and Sarah. And he says, you know what? I'm going to start with these people. I'm going to make of Abraham a great nation. And I'm going to start with that nation. And I am going to use those people as a place where I can become again their God. And they can be my people. And I can dwell with them. And through them, I'm going to reach the world. I'm going to start, though, with this group, Abraham and Sarah. And 400 years later, where are Abraham and Sarah's progeny? In slavery, in Egypt, once again. All that God did in the record, and you can read it, it's a great, it's a great record. What he did for Abraham, what he did for Sarah, what he did for his people. And still they ended up enslaved. Why? What is the problem here? It's the big S. It's the corruption of the human character and nature and soul that is constantly besetting God's people. But he doesn't stop trying. And he rescues these people out of Egypt. And they cross the Red Sea. Uh, they go through the waters. These are all, again, Genesis images. And in the waters, they get through the waters miraculously. And, the, and miraculously, the waters come back and they kill their destroyer. And so now they're free. They're free of slavery. They have come out. They were in exile in Egypt. He's brought them out of exile into a promised land. And the whole point of that, the whole point of it was so that he said, I want to dwell with you there. And so what he does, he tells Moses, I want you to build me a tabernacle, a tent. And here's exactly how I want you to build it. And if you ever want to read some very, very laborious verses, read the Deuteronomy, you know, the description of Deuteronomy of how God wants to make this tent. And by the way, he repeats it again, just in case you miss it. But the point of it is he wants this tent to be a microcosm, a small universe. It's got Eden images in it. It's got a garden in it. It's got this holy of holy place, and he wants to dwell in this tent so that the people that he called out from Abraham and Sarah can come in and be, what, near him. He wants them near him. And that's, he's just been trying, I just want to dwell with you. So here's what we're going to do. And he does it. I mean, it's this amazing record in the Bible. And we get to the end of Exodus, and the tent's built. And it says Moses couldn't enter in. So what does he do? God says, no, you can't enter in, Moses. Now, here's an interesting thing. The guy talked to God face to face, basically, on the mountain. You know, it's an amazing thing. His face shines so bright that he had to put a veil over it. But God says, you can't come in this tent. I need Aaron to come in this tent. And Aaron is going to have to be prepared. Seven days, recapitulating the seven days of creation, Aaron gets prepared. He puts on a whole outfit. And if you look at the description of the outfit, it makes him super tall, super glowing, super awesome. It's Adam again entering into the presence of God. God is showing you symbolically, here's what I always wanted. And now we're going to get this guy, Aaron, and he's going to represent you. And he is going to, after all this preparation, he's going to bring sacrifices, which I will receive. And then guess what? That will be your entrance, Israel, to come into this tent of meeting where I can dwell with you. And it's a great record, man. I mean, it's fantastic. And it culminates in, in Leviticus 9, and when it's done and the glory of God is there and the sacrifice, the fire comes down from heaven, laps up the sacrifices, all of Israel just falls on their, their faces and they praise God. He's here. We can dwell with him. And a few hours later, two sons of Aaron get drunk and go into the Holy of Holies and die. 
Now think about this. This is the history of humanity. It's like, what, what is the problem here? I mean, can you imagine what it was like if you just saw it from an angel's perspective or fallen angel's perspective? It's like thousands of years God has been wanting to dwell with these people, and we have successfully kept them away. And finally, Aaron goes in there, and the glory of God shows up in the tent. And Israel falls in the face, you're, you're our God. I'm your people. We're going to dwell together. And a few hours later, death enters in again. Why? Because you just can't, you just can't get around the sin problem, man. It's a real problem. And the rest of the history of Israel is replete <laughs> with this problem. It's, it's uh, the story of Leviticus doesn't end. And it goes on, and uh, the Old Testament goes on, and it, it is a story of uh, a cycle of God reaching out, wanting to dwell with people, and God being rejected over and over and over again. And really, what God is ultimately offering to people, his dwelling with them, is really representative of just life. It is life. When he breathes into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, that's what he wants for us. And there's no life when you're separated from him. That is the definition of death. Your body can be alive and you can be breathing. But there is no life when you're separated from him. And so this has been the issue all along. And it started with this amazing cataclysmic fall of Adam. And all of, all of history rushes forward to what is the point of the whole scriptures anyway. It's, it's, a, it's a cohesive story that points us to whom? Christ. It all points to Christ. And that's why in Romans 5, um, verse 12, and this is the uh, Passion uh, translation, and I want you to listen to this. And, and really, you know what this, Paul was a genius, okay? Paul was a just a bonafide genius, really. Uh, and he also, you should, you should think about Paul a little bit before we read this. I want you to understand who Paul was, just for a second. So Paul was, was raised at the feet of Gamaliel. Gamaliel was, was such a great teacher of the law, the Old Testament scriptures, so great that to this day, he is heralded as one of the top instructors in the Torah and in the Bible throughout all Israel, to this day. That was his teacher, and Paul was his prized pupil. He was the star. Paul was also raised in Tarsus, which is like being raised in Cambridge in our country. He was surrounded by MIT, Harvard. He was in the educational capital of that, of that world, and he was schooled in the Greek classics and in Greek philosophies. He was also a Roman citizen, which is not typical of all Jews back then. So here he is, steeped in the law, raised at the feet of Gamaliel, and, you know, very intelligent on his own, steeped in, in Greek philosophy and Greek culture, and a Roman citizen. The three major things of the whole world all funneled together into this guy, Paul. Now, this guy, Paul, was so zealous for God, so wanted God to return to Jerusalem, so desirous for Israel to get its act cleaned up so that God could come and dwell again in the temple like he, he hasn't been there since he left in Ezekiel, 600 years. It's time for Yahweh to come back here. And Paul took it as a personal mission. I am going to make that happen. And if you stand in the way of Yahweh coming back, you're toast. I will take you out. And he thought of Christians as absolutely those. They weren't called Christians. He thought of Jews who believed that Jesus was the Messiah we're absolutely dead wrong, and I am going to take you out because you are preventing Yahweh from coming back. That's what's happening here. And I understand the scriptures better than all of you, and I'm following them better than all of you, and I'm telling you, you are in the way. So you are worthy of death. And that's what he was doing until Jesus met him on the road and said, hey, I'm Jesus. It's true. And what did Paul do? What do you do? What do you do if you're Paul? You disappear for about 10 years or more. That's what he did. He took off. The great Paul takes off. 
And because he had to go like, I have to reframe the entire Old Testament now, as we would call it. I have to take everything I have ever known, everything I've ever believed, everything I've ever loved about Yahweh, everything I have ever hoped for in the Messiah, which is my entire life, and reframe it that the Messiah is not this Davidic king who's going to come up and kick butt, come back, kick butt, and set up a new, a new nation of Israel, and God's not going to just show up in the, in the temple anymore. No, it's this guy, Naz, this guy from Nazareth, a carpenter's son, who got brutally crucified. He's the Messiah. What do you do with that? Well, if you're Paul, you take some time and you think about it. But isn't it amazing that God blessed us here today. That guy wrote a bunch of letters, and he assimilated everything he understood about the Old Testament, the Torah, the Scriptures, the Word of God, and he reframed it and assimilated it so he could explain to everybody, Jew and Gentile alike, this is the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior. In Romans 5, verse 12, <clears throat> he says, when Adam sinned, the entire world was affected. Sin entered human experience, and death was the result. And so death followed this sin, casting its shadow over all humanity, because all have sinned. Sin was in the world before Moses gave the written law, but it was not charged against them because there was no law that existed. Yet, death reigned as king from Adam to Moses, even though they hadn't broken the, a command the way Adam had, the, the first man, Adam, was a picture, a, an image, a tupas of the Messiah who was to come. Now, there is no comparison between Adam's transgression and the gracious gift that we experience, for the magnitude of the gift far outweighs the crime. It's true that many died because of one man's transgression, but how much greater will God's grace and his gracious gift of acceptance overflow to many because of what one man, Jesus the Messiah, did for all of us. And this free-flowing gift imparts to us much more than what was given to us through the one who sinned. For because of one transgression, we are all facing a death sentence with a, with a verdict of what? Guilty. But this gracious gift leaves us free from our many failures and brings us into the perfect righteousness of God, acquitted with the words, not guilty. Death once held us in its grip. Death held you in its grip. Think about it. Death held you in its grip. It says in Hebrews that all human beings are subject their entire lifetime to the slavery of death. That's the human condition, and it's still true today. People are slaves to death. They're running out of time. They're running out of life. They're all afraid about the, the big death, right? And they don't know what's going to happen, and they are, we are all slaves to it until we are set free from it because of the not guilty in Christ. Death once held us in its grip, and by the blunder of one man, death reigned as king over humanity. Think about that. Reigning as king. Yahweh was supposed to be king. Death reigned as king. But now, much more. how much more are we held in the grip of grace and continue reigning as kings in life, enjoying our regal freedom, through the gift of perfect righteousness in the one and only Jesus, the Messiah. And just as sin reigned through death, so also this sin-conquering grace will reign as king through righteousness, imparting eternal life through Jesus our Lord and Messiah. Is that not awesome? It's a legal brief. He just summed up <laughs> in, in a few verses. This genius Paul just summed up the I mean, here's Adam and here's Jesus. Here's the first Adam, here's the last Adam. Let's note the difference. One brought death and a reign of death. The other brings a reign of what? Life. Okay. Um, one of the things that Paul does, because he was so steeped in the Old Testament and because it's what God obviously inspired him to do, was he likens life in the church and to the people he's talking to in the book of Romans and, and during that time to what had happened with Israel. So let's think about it. Let's think about it. When Christ came and he released you from the bondage of death, you were slaves, kind of like Israel being slaves where? In Egypt. And they, God says, no, you've been set free, crossed miraculously over the, the river, 
and into a promised land of life, right? And so when you get to that promised land, like Israel did, one of the things that Israel did that you just don't really want to repeat is they decided, you know what? I really miss the flesh pots of Egypt. Man, we had it good there back in Egypt, didn't we? On the other side of the river. Wasn't that awesome? You know, when we had other gods and we were just one, we, our lives were so fantastic as slaves. And it's like, we laugh about it. But God says, how about, I mean, Paul says in Romans 6, you know, when you go back to behaving and conducting yourself in according with your putrid, corrupted flesh that you had before you got born again, it's the same thing. And it's no laughing matter, right? Because he says you're slaves again to sin. Do you really want to enslave yourself again to that? And th folks, this is not a moral play. This is not about, well, let's be good people because we don't want to sin. It's, I don't want to be disfigured, do you? Do you want your, your, your image to be marred? Do you want to be a disfigured, de defaced person? No. So it's an inside gig. So don't go back there because it's disfiguring. It takes us out. And then in Romans 7, he says, Now, for those of you who think that you can follow a law you know, like the Torah, and you can make it there by following a law? Well, let's talk about that. How did that work out with Israel? Did they follow the Torah successfully and get to the point of life in all of its manifestations where God could dwell? No, he actually had to take off. As it says in Ezekiel, you can read about it. It's quite the scene when he takes off from the temple. He couldn't dwell with them anymore even though they had the law. And he says, so is the law bad? Was the law bad because it caused that? No. No, the law was holy, just, and good. The, the Torah was given by God in the book of, in, in, uh, in Deuteronomy or in Exodus and Leviticus. It was designed to bring you into his presence, to give you life. Here's a way, here's the instruction. That's what Torah means. This is the way. This is the way to have your, your presence with me. It's a good and holy thing, this law. But why didn't it work? Why didn't it work? Why couldn't they just follow it? And Paul tells you in Romans 7, because I have a problem inside. Inside, deep, so deep, it's not touched by the Torah. I can't get away from the death and the corruption that dwells in here. It slays me. And he gets to the point at that end of chapter 7 where he just, he says, For I know that nothing dwells in me that is in my flesh, for I have, nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Keep going, Carolyn. Next verse. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but what? Sin dwells in me, not Jehovah, not God. What's dwelling in us? Sin. That's the problem. Ever since the fall, that has been the problem. God wants to dwell with people, but there's something else dwelling there in its place, and it's death, and it's corruption, and it's a real problem. So much so that Paul got to the point at the end of chapter 7, he said, who's going to rescue me from the body of this death? Who's going to do it? I'm, I'm toast. There's nothing I can do. Whenever I try to follow the law of the way and do the right thing, I find that there's a law of sin in my members. Who's going to get me out of that? And then he goes, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Now, that's a little weird, isn't it? You're reading along, and he says, oh, this, this is impossible. So there's no condemnation. Wait a minute, you just said, you just said it's hopeless. And now you're saying there's no condemnation. But he's, he's, a, he's a funny writer sometimes. It's a little bit like, say, Garrett says, hey, Steve, you said you were going to come over tonight, and it's like 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I said, yeah, I'll be there. But I want to tell you, uh, my four tires are flat, 
my battery's dead in my car, and my garage door won't work. <laughs> I'll see you there, though. And you're like, what? But the way Paul structures his argument is the rest of Romans 8, 1 through 4, is, is the why. He starts with the punchline. But let me tell you why there's no condemnation anymore to those who are in Christ Jesus. For gar is the, is the connecting word. He, he loves connecting words. If you really want to get into Paul, you got to watch his connecting words because they're brilliant. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death, which is in your members. Think about that. The law of the spirit, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made you, set you free from that. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. How did he do it? By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the what? Big, this is huge statement, guys. I mean... You have to now think about it in the context, the way Paul thought about it. So all of history is rushing forward, all of that sin, that corruption, that impossible problem of humanity is rushing forward from the fall of Adam right up to Jesus Christ. And what, wh where do we find ourselves then? We find Jesus on his knees in the Garden of Gethsemane, praying, is there any other way, God, for this to work out? If, if there is any other way, man, I will take it. And three times, our Lord, I mean, this guy was no piker when it came to being bold and having courage and being willing to do whatever. And he'd, he had walked into threats where he knew his life was at stake many times. He was not a stranger to that. But this one, three times, he prays, is there any other way? And God said no. But he strengthened him. The Lord strengthened him. God strengthened him. He came to Jesus, and he strengthened him because he needed it. Because I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what. If you're the powers of darkness, and you have had kingship by way of death over God's people that he had wanted to dwell in, and you hated God, and here is a guy who you know you have to take out, what do you think you're going to do to him? What kind of punishment, what kind of evil, what kind of pressure, what are you going to, when you unleash all the bloodhounds of hell on this human being, what do you think you're going to do to him? And I want you to think about this. For the devil, it was pure pleasure. It pleased him. Every lash, every piece of flesh Every mocking, every spitting, it brought him pleasure. <clears throat> but Jesus took it. He took it. He took it to the point where you couldn't recognize him as a human being. So battered, so disfigured. This is a symbol of the disfiguration the devil had done to the nature, the character. He couldn't touch the nature of Christ, but he sure could disfigure his face. And so when he came out and Pilate said, hey, behold the man, it was not something you wanted to see, and the devil took pleasure in it. And he wasn't done yet, because he hasn't even been crucified yet. But I will tell you one thing. What Jesus had, besides the, the very Spirit of God in him and the presence of God to help him, what, what really extinguished that power, that sadistic pleasure taken in pain and all that stuff, you know, what, you know what extinguished that power? Love. Love. And if you think love is a warm feeling, then you, this ain't, ain't going to work. This is love. This is an active, powerful, full person, sacrificial state of mind, I am bringing good. You can bring everything you got. Do your worst. And in return, I'm bringing good because that's who God is. That's what I'm going to do. And he did it. He did it so well that when he got on the cross and it was getting toward the end, he looked around and said, forgive these people. Forgive them. They have no idea what they're doing. 
And when he died, if it had ended there, even after everything he did, if it had ended there and he stayed in the grave, what would it have accomplished for us? Nothing. Nothing. It'd just be another dead guy. And that's it. And we wouldn't be here. There'd be nothing. There'd be no hope at all. But who got him up? The God who has wanted to dwell with us from the beginning. I, this, is what, this, is, this is how I'm going to do it. This is how, this is how I'm going to do it. And you know, he shared the joy of his plan with his son because it was the joy set before him that allowed him to endure that cross and that pain. And that joy was, if you do this, I will get you up and I will put a stake in the ground starting with your physical resurrection that the restitution of all things starts here. And I will dwell with people again. And that's what he did. He got him up from the dead, folks. And by doing that, he gave us the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. If you will accept that sacrifice, if we will simply embrace that, if we will believe that, yes, Jesus was God's son, he was Lord, and that he was raised physically from the dead, if we will, if we will just wholeheartedly, wholethroatedly accept that, then guess what you get? This. This. Again. That's what you get. You get, you get the very presence of God in Christ. It's the prayer from John 17 that, that Christ prayed. I would just want them to be one. You and me, I and them, that they may be made complete in one. It's that dwelling place of God again. He can dwell again. And that's why it says in Romans 8, verse 5, it's an encouragement now. Okay, this is what's happened. You have this spirit, okay? So here's what you do. For those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. Now, I, please, you got to understand something. Flesh and spirit here is not this platonic idea that, well, he's talking about our bodies or he's talking about this ethereal spirit. No. This is not what flesh and spirit meant in the Bible at that time. It's what many people mean by now, but it was written thousands of years ago, okay? What they meant by it was a whole person that is given to that corrupted, degraded, defaced image of fallen man. That's the flesh. The spirit is just the opposite. It's the whole person who is given to the new image of the Christ in them the image-bearing capacity of a full human being once again. That's your choice, okay? Don't turn this into some ethereal, you know, body versus spirit. No, it's two things. So if I mind the things according to that corrupted guy, that's, that's where I'm, okay, that's where I'm at. If I mind the things, though, according to the, the whole person who is being directed by the spirit, it's life and peace. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. If Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life the life of the Spirit, because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and does He? Yes. yes. So this is you. If that's true, which is, which is true, He who raised Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. There's your hope. There's our great hope. There is a day. It's called the resurrection. When the spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead will raise us also. Our mortal bodies will receive, will get new bodies, and they will be enlivened by the very spirit of the living God, which makes them eternal. What Paul is talking about here in walking by the spirit is this 
remarkable phenomenon at the heart of our experience as believers. It's a new life. It's a new life, folks. It's newness. It's a new energy. It's a new way of being able to walk. You're not alone. You're not trying to dust off the old man and, and take that putrid, corrupted old man and make it look good. If you do that, you will fail. It's just like going and trying to follow the Torah. No, if you're going to walk your whole person by the spirit of the living Christ, then accept it. Accept it. And, and take this. But now, why do I want to clean up my life? Because if there's, if there's corruption in my life, if there's a stronghold that, that is in the way of this, then this will be less effective, right? I won't have the same level of life and peace that I could have if I could just remove the obstacles from this wonderful oneness with God. That's why we do what we do. We don't do it for morality reasons. We're not trying to be good people. Are you kidding me? That's hopeless. But the spirit of the, of the living Christ is in us. The mind of Christ is in us, and it is encouraging us. And it will actually, here's the deal, it'll really transform you. If you will just new up your head and put on the thoughts of the spirit, which is to say your whole person, your whole life dedicated to what God has done in Christ. If we do that, if we do that, he transforms us. We grow up into him in all things. It's, it's an amazing experience. That's what this is talking about in Romans 8. So walk in accordance with that stuff. Don't go back to Egypt. And don't think you're going to be able to clean up the old man with a bunch of rules and regs and disciplines. No. But yes, let's clean up our hearts. Let's remove anything that's in the way of this. Let's be dwelling places as best we can be for God. And one more thing, I just, well, I'll finish with this, but it's just a thought I want to get out there. Um, and I apologize if I'm running over here, but that verse 8, it talks about those in the flesh cannot please God. And this whole thing of pleasing God is a, is a kind of a big deal. It's, it's something that's in our heads, right? And there's a, there's a school of thought in the Christian church that, well, you can't, you know, if you try to please God with your works, well, you're just trying to get, you know, it's just merit-based relationship with God. You're not going to want to do that. Don't, don't bother trying to please. You're already perfect, man. You're, 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 you're already, no. Here's the deal, though. Flip that verse. If you're in the flesh, you can't please him. But if you're in the spirit, can you please him? Yes. Yes. But how do I do that? How, how does this play out in a real human life, folks? This is what we have to do with scripture. This is what we have to do with God's word. Make it practically human in your own life. How do I have a life, no matter what I'm doing, that it becomes pleasing to him? And I want you to think about that. I can't, I can't answer that question for you, really, specifically. You're going to have to. That's a wonderful, prayerful thing to go to God with. Show me how I can do that. And don't make it a moral play. Make it a this thing. How can I become much more close to you so my life brings you pleasure? And this guy, Eric Liddell, ever hear of Eric Liddell? Ever see the movie Chariots of Fire? Chariots of Fire, anybody? Oh, man, I'm old. You should watch the movie. It's a great movie. It's about an Olympic runner, but he was a, he was a believer. But he made a statement. He said, God made me fast, and when I run, I feel his pleasure. What did God make you? What did he make you? And it doesn't matter, folks. I mean, there's no hierarchy here of, of skill sets, right, or attributes. We are all, we all have something. What did he make you? Did he make you particularly good at being a handyman? Well, then you know what? If you lean into that, then you will feel his pleasure when you're doing the things that he has equipped you to do. Does that make sense? So ask him. And, and it's fine. And it's life, right? These things can change over time. We're not static people, but just lean into it. That, isn't that what it means to be a new creation in him? Isn't that what it means to walk in according with the Spirit? I think it is. Okay. Father, we thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> How do we thank you? Except by making ourselves living sacrifices, Father. <coughs> it's just our reasonable response, Father, to your mercies. And we just thank you so much for your goodness and for how you have once again taken up your dwelling place in us and with us. And we thank you for this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.